So Seamus, we've been really missing that uh, this dumb industry series. Do you have any advice for industry leaders? I have some advice for Bobby Kotick. First of all, I'm not sure how much you've been following what's been going on, but you know, Kotick's the head of Activision. And mm -hmm. the last few months have been just sort of a cavalcade of scandal. That's been uh, Activision and Blizzard? Activision Blizzard? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, the Activision Dash Blizzard is the name of the overarching company that owns Blizzard and Activision. It's confusing. But Kodak isn't in charge of Blizzard, at least not directly. Or, or is he? Right. Right. He is in charge of the whole, not in charge of the two arms. But, I mean, of course, you know, he can do whatever he wants. He can just reach down through the power structure and make them do whatever he wants. Which is kind of the problem, where the problem arises in this case. Right. But, okay, so there have been a number of scandals, like harassment scandals. Like, okay, to give you a sense of just how much Kodak is asleep at the wheel. Like 10 or 15, no, it was, it was just 10 years ago. Bobby Kodak said, I'm going to take the fun out of making games. Now, he was, <laughs> I think what he was trying to say is hey, we're not in here having a party, we're serious, we're getting work done. Right. No, right. I think that's bad. That's a bad attitude to take in an industry where, you know, all of these people have incredibly valuable skills and they can go to other technology industries and make a lot more money. So they're in games because mm -hmm. they want to have fun. They're, they're sacrificing pay so that they can enjoy their job. So if you try to take that away from them, then, you know, they won't want to work for you. <laughs> right. It's these... part of your compensation packages. You get to work at Activision Blizzard. Right. And especially at Blizzard, you know, Blizzard being one of the most successful game developers ever. Mm. Um, don't mess with the company culture, you idiot. You bought Blizzard. Um, it's the golden goose. <laughs> Stop trying to stuff yeah. it in the microwave. You idiot. But anyway, okay, so here's here's something that I've observed about abusive people. Like, abusive, powerful people. Anytime you've got a really powerful person, when they wrong somebody, that person is afraid to retaliate. For one thing, just mm -hmm. people in general are averse to conflict, right? Like, you know, somebody flips me off. I don't actually want to start a brawl in the street. I'd rather just, like, deal with being flipped off and get on with my day. There's nothing to be gained right. from, like, getting out and screaming at them. Most people see that as not worth it. It's just stress and adrenaline and danger for no benefit. Yeah. And then there's also, because this person is powerful, there's fear of retribution. What if I make a big fuss? Hey, this person wronged me and nobody comes to help me. Well, then they'll just turn around and crush me and there'll be nothing I can do. Mm. So powerful people that are naturally abusive um, can get away with it for a long time because everybody's afraid to retaliate. So let me tell you what was going on. Kodak said, I'm going to take the fun out of making games. So what I assumed happened is that, you know, Hey, you got to come in, you got to be working, you know, dress like it's bit you're coming to a business and not to a house party. You know, I sure. sort of, he was trying to corporatize the 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 company culture and make it less casual. That's what I thought. Mm. But no, apparently it was not unheard of for groups of guys to get drunk at work. And then go on a cubicle crawl, harassing the female employees. Is that part of Kodak's new policy or, <laughs> right. or not? That was my question. That was my question. Is this part of the plan, Bob? What are you doing? You're going to take the fun out of making games, but you're going to do it in a way that be does not benefit you? No, it's just he wasn't paying attention. This is what I took from it. Is that people would be complaining to HR, hey, wow. This workplace is really crazy, and they would get ignored over and over again, mm -hmm. or fired, or retaliated against. And pretty soon, you know, everybody that has a problem leaves, and the only people that are still there are the people that are just willing to put up with this chaos. And the people who don't have any other options.
Right, right. So, but you can imagine there were a lot of people with a grudge against him. And what happens when a powerful person does that for long enough is that, you know, everybody's afraid to come forward. But once a couple of people come forward and get away with it, once the conversation starts and people realize it's safe, then everybody comes forward and it becomes a massive dog pile. So it's like this, it's like this phase change. Like every, this mm. guy seems absolutely untouchable, but then you know, there'll be some event that is the straw that broke the camel's back and then everybody turns on him. Right, right. It's the, uh, in a single day, the downfall was accomplished and the smoke of his rising rises into heaven forever and ever kind of thing. Right. So a few months ago, I would have advised, hey, Bobby, this looks real bad. Your company is losing a ton of value the stock is on the way down and you've just given yourself the biggest payday of any executive ever in a time when people are really kind of pissed off about that sort of thing like it it's kind of like during the 70s gas crisis and you go roaring through town in a cadillac <laughs> you know <laughs> Are you just looking for trouble? Are you trying to make enemies? <laughs> like, I'm not trying to take away your Cadillac, but maybe you shouldn't go stirring up shit like this. Maybe you shouldn't make yourself an mm. obvious target. It's like, he's taking the fun out of video gaming in the same sense that a vampire takes the blood out of his victims. <laughs> yes! <laughs> so, he gave himself $200 million paycheck, which, that's enough money to develop like four games like did you create 200 Ugh. million dollars worth of value that year no so as a shareholder i would be pissed off you you are not like as a shareholder i would be livid blizzard is in steady decline it's suffering from a pronounced brain drain where like every year some some industry legend leaves you know to pursue other opportunities you know, and it's obvious they're just getting disgusted of working here and leaving. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, the last couple of years have been mired in controversy. And the only thing they've released is a remake of a game that was a classic that they ruined. And everybody, the, the remake is now the lowest rated game ever on Metacritic. <laughs> um, like, that's what they've been doing. The company is in decline in terms of performance. It's in decline financially. And the CEO just gave himself the biggest payday ever. So three months ago, I would have sat him down and said, look, this is an ideal time to cash in your chips. You just want a big hand at the table. It's starting to look ugly. The crowd is turning against you. You can walk away, do some bullshit like, I'm going to spend more time with my family, you know, and walk away mm -hmm. and enjoy in, this money. In Mexico. Right. <laughs> and it will be fine for you. But no, he hangs around and he hangs around and the scandals keep coming and keep coming. And, and you know, like I said, there's that phase change where now everybody that's ever had a X to grind with this guy is coming forward. Sure. And, and at a certain point, when they start falsifying records and stuff, then people start creating false claims because they know that no one's going to be able to validate that they're lying. And so then not only do you have the people you actually wrong, but you have people making stuff up that sounds plausible, which is an ever growing target. Right. The, the, the reveal in the last few weeks, I'm not sure the timeline here. I, I've been very loosely like i've been like every two weeks i catch up on the latest stories so i'm um, i'm usually pretty far out of date but apparently the latest batch of review reveals was some female employee was egregiously wronged okay horrifically wronged in a you should call the police kind of sense mm. it, and it was swept under the rug she brought it to bobby and he allegedly said if she talks he'd have her killed now does that sound cartoonishly implausible yes <laughs> but right it, but how would but you like, know but how would you there is the stuff that we know about the guy is so outrageous when you put it next to all the other stories 
it sounds plausible enough to me. <laughs> like, I wouldn't bet against oh, it. And so now my advice to him is like, think back to everything you've done in the last 10 years. Is there anything that you have done that has not yet come out? <laughs> and would it destroy you if whatever that is, it's about to come out? Now, if, right. and you can stop it all right now. You can stop it all. You just do that. Oh, I'm going to spend more time with my family and pursue other opportunities. And I've decided to start another company or some bullshit to save face. And then you quietly retire and you take a bunch of money with you. And that's the winning move right now. I mean, you know, because you'll get your I'm not sure that I'm not sure that he can even do that at this point. He's got the Federal Commission of Free Trade and the Federal OSHA, I think, are both like investigating the snot out of that company. Right. And maybe he can't step down. But um And you know, he, he's he definitely there's probably an instinct there of like, I should just I should just cut loose and be like, look, I'm really sorry. Uh, please don't have me drawn and quartered. And but there's, you know, all these lawyers that are like, look, we can save this. We can we can get you out of this. Don't worry. Just keep your mouth shut. But like since this but people are calling for his reg resignation now. So um, and the longer he fails to resign, the more angry people are getting. And you could just say, you know, Bobby Kotick murdered my puppy and people will believe it. <laughs> and um, right. he he murdered my puppy and ate it in front of my children. <laughs> and people would right. believe it. Who's going to so, countermand you? Yeah, exactly. So like it's it's time to cash out. You need to you need to act like you're just going to take a break, stand up, stretch your legs from the table, quietly take your chips with you and then Run. Run in the opposite <laughs> direction. As soon as you get out of sight of the table, just start running as fast as you can directly to the airport. <laughs> Retire to the moon. Get on the phone with Elon Musk. Just get off the planet. Um, I think this scandal is fascinating because the usual explanation is, well, you know, people will tolerate him because he's bringing in the money. And that has never sat well with me because I don't think Bobby Kotick does bring in the money. I think he's terrible mm. at it. Um, he's got a couple of franchises that bring in a bunch of money. And then it's obvious everything else is crumbling about around him. And now the stock is tanking. So like, what, and he's still in the, here's the amazing thing. The board just issued sort of a, a general letter voicing their support for him and i thought that was amazing <laughs> i would be i would be very scared if the board was like no we're behind you don't don't go don't go quite yet we're we're all here <laughs> we're your friends here like if i was on the board i would be like all the shit i've ever done this gives me a chance to cook up some emails and shove that blame over to his <laughs> side of the table uh-huh <laughs> Yeah, like, I mean, that's what happens when you're the when you're the first um, when you're the first one to go down. Everybody's gonna blame you. But no, they're supporting him, and they're oh, no. you know like, oh, we think he's great. And I'm like, he's losing money. So this is weird. Like, what does he have blackmail information on everybody else? My my advice to him is still take the. I mean, I don't want him to take the money and run. I'd love to see him go to jail. Is what I'd love to see. You know, that mm -hmm. would be delicious. That would make me happy. Is if he just went to jail but if you know he was my friend or i gave a crap about him i would be advising him to run get out any way you can make any <laughs> right, excuse right. get a doctor's note hey my health is bad my heart you know i'd love to stay and cooperate with this investigation but my heart is bad and you guys need a strong leadership so the, this young guy that i just hired he's healthy he's strong and it looks like he can take the beating you all want to give him <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, it is very baffling. I had a, a similar situation in my life where one of the pastors at one of the churches that we went to embezzled some hundred thousand dollars. And uh, and instead of, you know, being like, look, I'm really sorry, this is wrong. I'm stepping down. You know, I'd, I'd love to be part of this community. Just, you know, like, don't send me to federal prison. He was like, no, uh, there was a fire in my house and all the records were destroyed. And he ended up in federal prison. It makes sense to me because... Anybody capable of doing that kind of crime 
thought they could get away with it. That's why they did it in the first place. Mm. Yeah, it's the poker face thing. It was just like, I'm just going to bare face my way through this. It'll be it'll be great. I, it's worked every time so far. Right. And it's that face change. You You think you're getting away with it, but really... The whole thing's crumbling around you, and you can't it's see it. Accumulating, yet. it's just that that comeback is just winding up behind you, <laughs> right? The old boomerang's on its way back. Oh man! Well, yeah, that's that's a sad story. That's probably uh, not as unique as we would hope. No, it is. It is a sad story, but it's also because I just resent what Kodak has done to Blizzard. And there is a small amount of comfort in just seeing the guy get raked over the coals and seeing him hated even, like, among his money buddies. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to him getting his comeuppance. Uh, but yeah, it's sad. It's sad. And it's not worth it. It's not worth that these thousands of people should have had to be miserable for years just so Bobby Kotick could have a shitty day. <laughs> so... One of these days when, when the when the feds show up to ask him some questions. Boy. Well, Paul, please tell me you have something less dire to talk about. Well, uh, I mentioned last week that I bought a new computer with all my fat 3D model commission money. And uh, nice. it's a you know, it's a normal normal edge computer, I guess. Uh, these days that's like over a thousand dollars. It is weird. Like, computers have kind of gotten more expensive. Like, eight years ago, you could get a really decent machine for a few hundred bucks. And now it feels like to really get something good, you need to get close to a thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The graphics card sure. alone was like $700. Ow. Yeah, it's nuts. But, so that's the downside. It costs a lot of money. But, you know, it's just money. And uh, so I, I was like, all right, I'm going to buy this computer. And then it's like, don't forget to buy a copy of Windows. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm not going to buy a copy of Windows. I'm going to I'm going to go for Linux. I'm going to do Linux this time. A bold move. So how'd it go? Well, uh, so I downloaded Pop OS. And uh, this is the first time that I actually ran the SHA-256 hash on the download. And that thing is so long that I actually like wrote a little Python script to <laughs> compare <laughs> one on the website with the one in that resulted from the hash thing because otherwise I'm not going to read through that whole thing and like check every digit but yeah that's how it goes I guess and uh, so I installed Pop OS you know I installed it to a, a flash drive and booted it up computer booted, booted first try that's always encouraging I uh, very optimistically put all the screws in the case before I, I turned it on and uh, you fool out. I know right it was, it was this this wild optimism thing, but somehow, somehow it worked out. But, uh, so I got, I got Pop! OS installed and, uh, it's a, it's a, I think a Ubuntu flavor and, uh, it requires a password. And that was a little bit vexing because even Microsoft doesn't force you to have a password on your computer. I remember for a while, my wife's password was space. Like one press of the space bar? Yes. <laughs> uh, so I, I put the password in. And uh, all the kids are like, oh, you have a password now? What is it? What is it? I'm like, no, guys, I'm going to make you your own account on this computer. So you can have your account where you can't mess anything up. And then I'll have my account where I can do what I need to do. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, I've got this brand new computer, you know, like install uh, Linux or uh, Linux, install Steam and install uh, the GIMP and all that stuff. And uh, Audacity and, and Blender, of course. And I was like, wait. How fast is this new computer? Like, how much faster than my old computer is it? Is it even faster? I spent all this money. Like, how would I know? And I know that there are benchmarks and stuff. All right. But, but I decided to make my own benchmark, and you can download it. There's a, there's a link, uh, to the the folder, and it's got a render, and it's got a Blender file, and you press F12, and it'll render it out, and then in the top left corner it shows like how how many seconds it spent rendering the thing, and so I did a few benchmarks. And a uh, new computer runs it in 38 seconds. Uh, the computer from a couple years ago, back in 2019, runs it in 80 seconds. And then I also built a, an ITX, same case, uh, from 2015. And that runs it in 136 seconds. So it's it's gotten much faster. But it, it's really confusing me because 
they all look the same. They're in the, exactly the same case. <laughs> and I don't know how right. they could be any faster if they don't have like racing stripes or, or the spoilers on them or whatever. <laughs> right? Oh, this is weird. Uh, Paul, it looks like you are you were in dire need of optimization. This thing could go a lot faster. Based on this setup, I don't see any rainbow lights. How do you expect to maximize <laughs> the performance without rainbow lights? It's got it's got a little plug on the motherboard for the RGB LED output, but I didn't have to get anything up to it. My goodness. I'm surprised it runs at all. It doesn't even look like it's got just it doesn't even have monocolor lights. How do you how does it even turn on? What powers it? It doesn't have a speaker case. It can't go beep when you turn it on. Oh, that's that's uncomfortable. It is a little uncomfortable. So then I started booting up other op applications. Blender worked. Uh, it worked great. Um, booted up the GIMP. And I don't know about you, but when I boot up the GIMP in Windows, it always takes like 12 seconds. And I don't know why. It's it's very strange. But I figured it was always just like, oh, well, you know, it's open source software and they've got all these scripts running or something. It's all programmed in JavaScript or who I, knows what. I always assumed it was the frameworks they used for drawing the interface, you know making dialogue boxes that thing is just an a it's just a uh what do you call that a, a, a teetering tower of abstraction structures right 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 it is code that imports code that imports code that imports code <laughs> right but no it must be that all the stuff you need to do to get windows to for it to get run in windows is bogging it down because in linux it boots up in like two seconds my goodness so then I was like, well, you know, I'd like to do some gaming on this computer, um, but it's Linux. But I've heard that Steam has Proton integration or something so that you can run Windows games in Linux. And so I booted up the Steam store. And uh, the first thing that I noticed was that the store page is all non-parsed HTML. Like it's just right all out there. And there's a screenshot in the, in the document. I've been looking at this screenshot since the show started and wondering what the story behind this was. This is crazy. Yeah, it looks like Steam, except the, where the store usually appears, it looks like you did view page source. Except not even that, because it's black on dark gray. This looks uh -huh. like Batman decided to view the page source. <laughs> And it, but it's still got that little green lock icon in the top left corner, so you know that it's secure. <laughs> it's secure. In fact, it's even more secure because it is both HTTPS secure and secure to the point where absolutely no code will be run on this site. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what I don't know what Steam is doing there, but um, I, the web browser works fine right out of the box like it can render html the computer is capable entirely capable of, of viewing whatever this is i guess they've like rolled their own web browser inside the steam app but i thought they wrote this in linux like this seems like the kind of thing that that should not happen right very baffling I forget. so anyway i I've, I've yeah. not done any research on how to fix this or how to or if anyone else has this problem i just figured Steam is, is like the biggest video game company in the world. Um, they could have fixed this if they wanted to, and they didn't. So that's that's how it is, I guess. That's really sad. I mean, I won't be able to buy any games. I can still view the games. That's the crazy thing. You go over to the library tab and it's just like normal. So I can play all my games. I just can't buy any <laughs> new ones. <laughs> so I booted up uh, the, the library and I was like, okay, well, how many of these are... are Linux capable. I've got 116 games in my library and 68 out of those are, you can run native in Linux. Uh, and so I assume that's all like the Unity games and you know stuff like that. And then there's one, so I, I turned on Proton integration and uh, it, it's on by default. So I turned it off just to see what, what it was, but uh, it, I turned on Proton integration and there was one additional game that was whatever they call it, vetted for use with Proton, where it's like, we verified that this game works like intended when using Proton. So like one game out of that whole library is like, okay, Proton will work with this. But then way at the bottom of the menu, there's this button for, or checkbox for experimental Proton something or other. And and, and it pops up a warning. It's like, hey, be careful. Your game might not run properly. It might crash. 
And uh, then every time you launch a game using the experimental Proton integration, it pops up a little bot dialog box before you run it, and, and it's like, hey, just so you know, this is running experimental Proton, so if there are any problems, it's not the game dev's fault, it's your fault for trying to run it on Linux. Right. But does it work? But, yeah, I, I was I was very impressed. Uh, I, I ran it for Dyson Sphere Program, because that's one of the ones that only works on Windows, but experimental Proton just, they worked out of the box, it was fine. Um, other Waters and Other Waters, that's another, it's a game we'll, we'll talk about a little later, I guess, if we, if we get to it. Yikes, we're going long. And uh, and that worked fine. And uh, I tried a few other Windows games. And then I was like, okay, well, what's what's the game that, like, high-end graphics, you know, like, it, not intended even for Windows. Like, it's not, it's not, you know, Windows native. It's some sort of port from some other platform. And I was like, oh, I know just the one. I know just the one. I'm going to boot up No Man's Sky and Experimental Proton running on Linux. Oh, tell me it worked. Well, I mean, it worked in the sense that I was able to play No Man's Sky. Um, but <laughs> that was not, that was not a pleasant so that's experience. That's kind of unfortunate. Yeah, I was, I was like, okay, it all runs, but yikes, is this a bad game still? Like, I didn't even play it for two minutes. It was just like all the hold to activate button thing, right? Is, uh, no. No, you can't take me again, No Man's Sky. Right? Everybody's like, oh, this game has been rehabilitated. They added all this new content. And I'm like, yes, but the interface is still an atrocity. Yeah, and the whole thing slides around when you move your cursor as if you're in Destiny or whatever. Ugh, so, crazy. it works. You know, I haven't found a game that doesn't run in experimental Proton on Linux on my PC. Uh, it is... That, that is very encouraging. That warms my heart. Mm. I think it's somewhat odd that it gives you a dot. Hey, warning, you're going to use experimental Proton and it might crash. It's like, well, why don't you put a, a dialogue like that on Windows? Hey, warning, you're about to run <laughs> something in Windows. It might crash. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the, I think the idea is that the devs developed it for windows and now they're like they never intended it for it right. to be run on linux and so like it's not the devs fault i think they're kind of you know saying like look you're doing a thing that the devs didn't design to do so like if it crashes don't send a bug report but yeah that would that would be nice if you could just send a bug report directly to microsoft when anything went wrong <laughs> warning you're about to run this under windows which is actually what the designer intended but probably not what anyone wanted yeah so speaking of stuff that sucks have you been following the story of youtube removing the dislike button you know i heard about it and every time i looked at a youtube video it still had the dislike button like the number of dislikes and so i don't know what's going on I've been wondering the same thing. Everybody's upset about this. Now, I uh, agree this doesn't... Like, uh, why are people... Is this just only on the mobile app? Because that doesn't make any sense. It sounded like they were still going to give you a thumbs up button, but they were going to remove thumbs down and hide the number of likes. That's what I thought the story was. But hmm. nothing seems to have changed. But, um, you know, one of the founders of YouTube is Jawed. Um, or Jawed. I'm not sure how you say I'll bet it's Jawed. <laughs> um, and, of course, he has the first upload to YouTube. He has the, the first U video on YouTube. Which hmm. now ha has 203 million views. Oh. And, um, but, he, you know, he, he left the company early on, I think when Google took over, like he hasn't been part of the system in ages. He's part of the but sellout, he, he sold out to Google. And... Right. And, but like some of the other founders stuck around, but he left and he posted, he updated this original YouTube video with his critique, um, of removing the dislike button and I thought it was fascinating I'm going I think I might even have the full text of it in the show notes just because I think it's really good but his point is YouTube is just so vast so vast that of course a lot of garbage gets uploaded and you need tools 
to help the youth, help the crowds sort out what they want and what they don't want. And the dislike and like buttons are essential for that. And, you know, if you're not using that, or if you're hiding that or making it weaker, then you're really, he, th I'm going beyond his text now, then you're driving, then you're having it driven by algorithms, which if, you know, that's just them pushing whatever's most profitable, <laughs> right? That's just mm -hmm. YouTube's algorithm deciding to show you the videos that it would most benefit from you watching instead of the thing that you would most like to watch. Yeah, which, I mean, they've been doing for a while, I'm sure. Right, but this is sort of just the last vest. This was the last tool we had for sorting out the the good from the bad. And now they're trying to take even this away from us. And they tried to frame it as like, oh, well, you know, it's really hard on creators. And, you know, to see, if you post a video, it'll really hurt your feelings if everybody dislikes it. And I'm like, and just nobody's buying that. Yeah, what are the most disliked videos? They're all like corporate announcements and PR firms and, and polit politicians. And YouTube Rewind itself. Like, that's, who <laughs> did, like, <laughs> like, that's the most disliked thing ever, is, there, is when they replace their video celebrating indie creators with their corporate, you know, here's all the full celebrities that are willing to work with us, see how cool we are? And, um... You know, if you cared about the feelings of creators, th this was not the place to start. Like, <laughs> there are a lot there of are, things there that are, are many very things you could do. Yeah, yeah, that that would help their that would give them good feelings more than taking away the dislike button. <laughs> but anyway, Jawed's response, which I know, I wish I'd copy and pasted it when I first saw it. It was. It was like seven paragraphs, and now I see it's down to five. I should copy and paste this into the Google Doc before he changes it again. <laughs> I'm sure there's a Wayback Machine version or something. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll t check on that. But anyway, that's worth a read, and I'd like to hear what people think of it. Um, so, wait, Ludo Naricon? Is that a real thing, Paul? Or is that a it joke? It really is a real thing, apparently. Uh, I picked up, quote, In Other Waters, unquote, a uh, game. It's a, kind of a narrative, uh, top-down, lightweight, vector graphic uh, narrative game. And uh, on their store page or something, or in the updates, they reference, like, hey, we're going to Ludonera Con this year. And I'm like, wow, that is just... I don't know anything about the con, but it, that's just, like, a beautiful name. Because it's a play on words, of course, of ludonarrative dissonance. Only it's consonants, right. only, but it's also a convention. So just, oh, yeah. Oh, chef kiss. <laughs> right. But it also you know, sounds other like something... Is fine. It sounds like something somebody would come up with to make fun of the games industry itself. Like the big AAA developers would like go to Ludo Narrative Con to find out how to create more Ludo Narrative dissonance because this is something they're trying to maximize. <laughs> yeah. So that was basically it. The the uh the In Other Waters game is, is fine. It's it's a little uh a little slow, a little the writing's not fantastic. It's fine. What do you say we do some mailbag questions? All right. Dear Diecast, what are your favorite NetHack memories? Also, thoughts on getting in trouble for playing immoral games. Sincerely, Bobbert. Uh, okay, NetHack memories? I don't have... I mean, it's been over a decade since I played around a NetHack. So, I don't have any vivid memories of NetHack. I mean, you know, there's just... Oh, there's that one time I died... Um, Wait, I fell, or like, I fell through a hole in the floor, and then I survived, but then my pack landed on top of me and killed me. Like, stuff like that, but that's, <laughs> that sort of thing happened to everybody. Like, I don't have any unique stories about NetHack. Mm -hmm. And getting in trouble for playing immoral game. What's an immoral game? I would assume that NetHack is considered an immoral game. I mean, oh, I, I was thinking immoral in the real world, like people would condemn you for playing it. Like what, Postal? Something that's just really <laughs> offensive. 
Is there like some Nazi simulator that out there that like <laughs> that, like I don't know about? Um, where you try and you know, I'm <laughs> Hitler was a lightweight. I'll do it right this time. <laughs> Get my I guess. Manage my SS. I mean, like, what would that be? An immoral game? That's kind of like the hook with games is that it's a simulated system where nobody gets hurt. So. You know, you can blow up the whole universe and nobody cares. It's fine. Um, you can blow up the whole universe within the game. So I'm not sure what they mm. mean by immoral games. An immoral game, I would think, is a game that psychologically manip manipulates you into putting more money in. You know, like a casino. That would be, I would consider mm. that to be immoral. Something, or something that's just outright fraudulent. A game that, you know... But that's not immoral to play. It's immoral to make and release and run. Yeah. So I so I assume that you never got in trouble for playing any video games. No. Oh well. You know what? Uh I grew up in a pretty conservative household, so I did get I did get some flack um for some of the games I played, but I was eighteen at the time, so I really didn't see my parents' input on video games as valuable to me, and I was, well, I thought I was about to move out. I was actually a few years away from moving out. But, you know, I, I got a little bit of finger wagging, but it never, you know, I was never prohibited from doing anything in particular. So, hmm. I don't know if you, does that qualify as getting in trouble? Is having somebody annoy you? <laughs> I guess. I was um, restricted from uh, buying and playing some kinds of games when I was young. Um, but like, other than that, I don't know, I, thoughts on getting in trouble. I guess, I guess, well, so my view on, on morality in games isn't quite as lax as yours. I would say that a game is a way to practice and explore something that is too expensive to explore in real life, whether in terms of cost of life or monetarily or time or whatever. So like Kerbal Space Program, you're exploring space and, but you know, a space program costs billions of dollars. And so you can do it in a computer game for basically free. Um, and this actually ties in to one of the later questions. So maybe we'll just go into that later. <clears throat> um, one of my favorite un immoral things to do in a video game was the original Master of Orion. When you could conquer a planet and you could either genocide the existing part, if you took over a planet and it's inhabited by your enemies, mm. you can either genocide them and it'll kill X number of them every turn. I mean, it's a lot. It's not like, oh, you're slowly whittling them down. It's like, this is a purge and it's like, you know, a hundred million every year <laughs> until they're all dead. Or you can enslave them. And when you do that, it, the the population of the planet is shown as a stack of icons. Mm. So, you know, think of it like a stack of poker chips, right? With little pictures on them. And you're either every turn taking a handful of them and just throwing them off the table, or they're all replaced with a picture of that species, but now in chains. And I was, please don't quote this out of context, a huge fan of slavery. <laughs> I was an <laughs> evil bastard. I didn't even, like, it was inefficient to have, um, if you wanted your people to live on this planet, it was incredibly inefficient to share it with another species. They would constantly be fighting against you and hate you and everything. But if you didn't want to live there and you just wanted to subjugate them, I guess from orbit, you could do it and you could get them to work. And here's the demented, twisted, horrible thing that is... It's, it's twisted because it's true. That first generation will fight you tooth and nail and you'll never get any work out of them. But if you stick with it and you're willing to invest the time in subjugating this species, that you will eventually breed out the rebels and they will become docile over time and accept their fate. Ah, oh, it's so and, good. Massive Orion, such right, a great series. Right? It, but that is just so evil but it, the game didn't like have this like that's so evil we don't want to encourage players to do that we'll we'll have 
we'll have space angels show up and and like try and murder you for being so evil like you know in um some video games if you're you're too evil the system itself will push back against you some some vigilantes will show up and try to kill you or whatever mm -hmm. but not in this game it's up to you and your conscience and i really appreciated that and that was part of your strategy like am i going to be evil or am i going to try and be nice? like some games i'd be like no we're doing this right i'm not going to pick fights i'm not going to enslave anybody um and really if you aren't going to enslave then well, genocide has got to be off the table too but that means you can't conquer a planet so what do you right. do with them when you've got a belligerent enemy that just won't quit bombard them from orbit that actually turned out to be pretty good is just make the planet so worthless like okay you've got like two million people still living there you can have the planet now it's it's a giant irradiated crater right you bomb all their production facilities and everything right and i just appreciated the game letting you decide what you think of what you're doing and you can play the evil empire you can be the emperor the evil emperor or you can try and and be space hero guy and it's totally up to you and the game doesn't need to judge you because you can tell what you're doing is wrong and you right. probably you probably as a human being have some feelings about it i loved it mm. uh going back to nethack for a minute i never played nethack but i did play Lindley's dungeon crawl and uh i've included a link to the first and oh no I, I guess i i did beat it twice but uh the first time i beat the game i saved my my character file and so there's a, a link to that and that was a, a grand old couple of weeks oh wow i should look this game up it was it uh text-based like net hack mm, yeah yeah it's an ascii graphics dungeon crawler i didn't even know there was i didn't realize there was that much content competition in this genre <laughs> Yeah, well, there's also Rogue, right? I've never played Rogue either. Right, me neither. Go ahead and take this next one. Seamus. Good evening. I know it's almost certainly too late for the next diecast, but there's always another. Would you be able to comment on the recent failures of DRM as seen here? Do you think these problems might actually turn the tide given the relative lack of utility to a DRM scheme now? No signature, no signature. And there are three links. So, the, the thrust of this article here is... There's a DRM scheme that looks at some physical property of your processor and uses that to identify it and to make sure it's running on a, you know, a processor that's allowed to run it. Hmm. And and is it like locked to the processor or something? I believe so. I can't quite Yikes. follow it, but that's what i assume and i know they've been trying to do this for years like a way to cleanly identify a particular machine that isn't going to change oh i put in a new sound device and all of a sudden it thinks this is a whole new computer uh-huh but this system breaks on certain processors that you know weren't around oh newer processors have a different api or something right I mean, I don't think this was something that Intel built as part of a spec. This is just as something that emerged as a physical characteristic of CPUs. And somebody mm. found a way to use it. And of course, Intel isn't like going out of their way to continue to support this. Again, this is conjecture based on reading this article that I barely understand. Okay, so I might be getting it wrong. Feel free to correct me in the comments. So a new generation comes along and this system no longer works or it works incorrectly or whatever and your the game doesn't work um the question here is and it says and it's got a list of games that suffer from this and i see a lot of football man like every football manager from the last four years which there are more than four of them because football <laughs> manager uh, there's the, most of this list looks like Ubisoft stuff because Ubisoft just okay. Here's here's the the answer to the question. Um, this no name person asks, "Do I think this will turn the tide?" In other words, will this get people to abandon? No, because DRM has been incredibly pointless for years. 
It has been all downside. It generates negative stories. Ubisoft has had many stories like this where games were broken. People were locked out of their games and everybody goes, ha ha, this just makes me want to pirate the game. Ubisoft has been through this so many times and they can see sales data. They can see some companies um, use DRM and some don't. And there isn't a strong correlate. There isn't really any correlation between sales and having DRM. You know, the, <laughs> the data it seems is like there. there's a negative correlation when people have done research, right? Right. So the numbers are already there. There's no reason to spend money fighting pirates. Although De, De Nuvo, by making parts of the game online did get around quite a bit of it. Maybe that's what this system is. Maybe that that really strong thing that was in De Nuvo that just worked aces for a few years is breaking for for newer get or on newer machines. I'm not sure. Mm. But um but even well the whole point was De Nuvo kind of proved that DRM was a waste of money because you had a game that could not be pirated for six months. And it didn't sell any right. better than the than the previous edition, which was pirated right away. So it's like, so why are you still doing this? Um, yeah. So and and like, if, it's so crazy because like it only works for a few months. Like you can't you can't prevent people who are technical wizards from bypassing your locks and stuff. It's like it's like they've got hardware access. How do you think this is going to work out for you? Right. The analogy I'd like to use is, how could I give you a book that you can read but you can't copy? Anything mm -hmm. I did to make it so that you couldn't copy it would also make it so you can't read it. Yeah. Yeah, it's so silly. So, no, I don't expect this will change anything. It's another interesting data point. And there is DRM that works. I mean, it's, it's Steam. It's just... DRM through convenience and make it really, really easy to get access to your games and get access to your save files and get access to your mods and stuff. And then you use their platform. And so you have to log in and like, it works great. Right. Um, for the vast majority of people, that's good enough. The vast majority of people don't even know how to download 7-Zip. <laughs> I know, right? Like that's too much of a hurdle. So like download 7-Zip and install a virtual drive or I forget what the steps are because, you know, I don't use pirated software. But I know from reading about this sort of thing that it can often be fairly involved to get these games running mm. and uh, required some technical skill and some patience and using a BitTorrent client. Definitely not turnkey. Not as easy as going on Steam, paying $10 and getting a game. Right. And for most of your customer base, the price of a game, you know, is the, the technical hurdle of piracy is too big for people that have $60 to spend on video games, have jobs and lives, and most of them don't want to venture into the dark alleys of the internet. So, yeah, it's a waste. Even if it wasn't impossible in a technical sense, it doesn't make economic sense. You're chasing yeah. a small group of people. Who were never going to pay for a game anyway. Right. Or who are using the pirated version as a demo to see if they like it. And then they buy it later. Which does happen and not insignificant amount. But the thing I've always worried about is what this does to, um, to the future. You know, if we were using this kind of DRM back in the 90s, then all those old 90s tiles, titles would be dead to us now. Um, it, they would, we would only be able to play them through piracy. All their DRM right. would be broken. Nobody would there's nobody out there patching up, you know, Thief the Dark Project to make sure it runs on modern machines. Well, nobody that owns it. There's modders and, you know, fans, but the people that own right. the property now aren't doing that. So all they're doing is killing their own legacy. Imagine mm -hmm. if... Yeah, imagine if Alfred Hitchcock had made all his movies so that after 15 years, they just dissolve. The negatives dissolve and the film is gone forever. Or, or printed them on, I don't know, nitrate film in 08. They did that for a while. They did that. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Back in uh, you know, like some decades ago, they they do all these films on nitrate film, but it was extremely flammable. And so then there was this big fire in a warehouse that had all this film, and it just like the whole thing burned down. And so then to prevent them from burning down the future, they just destroyed the films. <laughs> Damn it. Well, this brings us into our next topic. Dear Diecast, recently there have been a number of remaster slash remake failures. Warcraft 3, Forge, GTA Remastered, 3 VC, and SA. I, as a non-programmer, am quite confused about this. Aren't modern game systems easier to code for? Aren't there more ready-made tools for making game coding easier? Why does it take a team years to remake a game when they already know exactly what the end product should look like? It's not like they have to develop that as they go. And then they end up screwing it up. Shouldn't make that, but with bigger resolution, modern system support, and better textures be trivial to do? With kind regards, Chris. Thank you, Chris. That's a fantastic question. So, fun story. I've used um, the engine that Grand Theft Auto 3 runs. I was using that in the 90s. Um, hmm. My company used Renderware. In fact, our company was screwed by Rockstar when they bought Criterion, who owned Renderware. We... We had this graphics engine. This isn't a game engine, it's graphics engine. It only does rendering. It doesn't like handle game objects and it's before OpenGL. No, no, no. This was post OpenGL. Um oh. but it was before um it was right around the time of Unreal Engine, which I think oh. was the first big game engine that you could actually license. But we weren't using that. We were using renderware and that was just rendering and we were you know we handle all the game objects ourselves sure and if i had to get that running to if you handed me that old source today a 1998 version of renderware it would be a huge pain in the ass to do anything with it because the underlying structures have changed so much now if all you want is the old thing with bigger bigger resolution you should be fine you can probably get away with that but if you want to enable any new features let's say you want full screen anti-aliasing bump mapping hdr lighting anything like this that engine does not have those features and you have to cry and this is an engine that was written before those features were even dreamed up so you mm -hmm. have to crawl down into the bowels of this engine and re-implement those features on an ancient engine. It's like adding airbags to a Model T. That's harder than adding mail airbags to a modern car, right? Or anti-lock yeah. brakes to a modern a Model T. Or, or chains, like snow chains. It's like the tires don't even work with snow chains. Right, right, because the ch tires are shaped all wrong wrong diameter wrong connections wrong bolt size everything's wrong and you end up having to rewrite huge sections of it but it's not just that you have to rewrite it you have to write a new version that works exact that looks visually identical to the old one mm, yeah and so yeah it can be quite challenging work and this is especially true because to really do that kind of work you need an old graybeard programmer who was around back in the day. You can't hand a project off like this, like this off to some 20 something. Like they were born when this program, when, when the original um, GTA came out, right? Or they were a toddler. They don't have any knowledge of how those old rendering engines worked. Yeah. And you could reverse engineer it from first principles, but it's, again, it's going to take a long time. Right, yeah. So the gap between there and here is so big that anytime you want to add anything, you it is a tremendous amount of work. But it is true that you should be able to take the old code and recompile it and get exactly what we had back then. But unfortunately, then you just have a game that runs in 4.3 and maxes out at, you know, 1024 by 768. Like people, people don't want right. to pay for that. That's useless. That's what the old one is. And so the thinking goes, well, we want people to pay us money for this. If we're going to, if we're going to make a version that will run on Windows 10, well, we should give them some modern convenience features. Hey, maybe you'd like a higher frame rate. Oh, but wait, the frame rate is tied to the physics engine and the physics engine is 
is frame rate based. So if you just crank the frame rate up to 144 frames a second, then it'll just feel like all the physics move super fast and it'll uh -huh. be all weird. And yeah. So now and you have to you decouple might be, that. You might be thinking like, well, why don't you just scrap the engine? You've got access to all the 3D models and all the textures and stuff. Just take all that stuff and put it into a new engine. That should be easy, right? But again, it's more complicated than that because a lot of these old games were designed with hardware-specific optimization in their models and, and animations and things. And so there's all this crazy... They didn't have H.256 or whatever it is, the, um, the modern video compression. So a lot of them rolled all their own video compression. They, they didn't have oh, modern yes. graphics yes, all the... compression for oh. JPEGs. They have that, didn't have JPEGs back in the day. So like all the all the texture maps are all in these wonky formats, and all the stuff is you know decoded using arcane tricks in in uh, in the machine code or whatever, and it's just a nightmare. Um, that's what Grove Street Games they did that um, for the Grand Theft Auto remaster. And that's one of their problems. They took all those assets and put them into the modern Unreal Engine. But modern engines animate skeletons very differently. The old renderware just stored um, animations as a series of rotations. Oh, you want to salute? Well, that's, you know, rotate your shoulder, you know, along this, you know, this many degrees, your elbow this many degrees, and your hand this many degrees. And now you're in the salute position. But, you know, mm. modern engines also contain all the offsets. Oh, the shoulder is this many units away from the spine. And it, you rotate it here and, you know. So the new system enables you to do things like take a gun off your belt and hold it in your hand, which the old system mm, couldn't do. Right. But the old system will also, if you put a male animation on a female skeleton will morph that female into a male proportion. Her legs will get shorter, her torso will get longer, her shoulders will get broader, her face will get more squat. And it will look absolutely terrible. That's a lot of what happened, especially um, in the old games. Um, you know, they had some stylized uh, skeletons. I think Big Smoke's skeleton doesn't actually work for a human being. Big smoke in the game is very fat. And mm -hmm. if you were to take the fat off his body, you would not have a skeleton of human proportions. His shoulders were really wide and maybe his head was like oddly far from his body for some reason. You know, maybe the anchor of his head was actually up in his hat for some reason. And it didn't <laughs> matter back then because the skeleton was just rotations. But now that it's rotations and positions, when you apply a modern skeleton to it, his body will contort into horrific proportions. And the only way to fix that is to redo. Not only do you have to convert all the old animations, but you have to make a version of every animation for every skeleton. So if oh, you have yeah. male, female, and fat guy, then you need to put every, you know, you don't know what it's going to need. So you better make three versions of every one of the original and test them somehow. So yeah, it can get away from you very quickly. Um, yeah. So it makes me wonder if like the two minute papers have been doing a lot on AI up resolution and like realification where you can take like a computer game and make it look like real life. And I wonder if that isn't the way forward for porting old games is just to put a AI filter over the top of it and call it a day. I'd love to see what that looks like. Um, it's an interesting idea. Would that run in real time? I don't know. It would be fun. And the advantage of that is you could turn that on and off. People yeah. really enjoy that. When you can turn it off and go back to the old and then re-enable the new, that's really fun for people. Mm. Of course, it wouldn't fix all the jingoistic dialogue, but... <laughs> it's a shame about this remaster. And one interesting thing is, we talked about this last week, the Grand Theft Auto games, the ultimate definitive edition, is actually a modern port. Okay, years ago, a small mobile developer ported the three games to mobile platforms. Then when they went to do the definitive edition, 
for like the PC and modern consoles. They started with that mobile version. Oh, I did not pick up on and, that detail. That makes a little more sense, yeah. I guess. Right. And so people have been discovering more and more and more things that are just missing. You drive a car into the water in 2002, it would make a big splash in the modern game. It just goes in and makes ripples in the water, but there are no particle effects. Um, you shoot out the window of a car. In 2002, glass flies everywhere. In the new game, the the glass just vanishes in a single frame. It just stops being rendered. And so it's like particles don't work. Um, there's a bunch of stuff like that that people are discovering is missing. Um, it's really bad. and um, But it is so bad, and it's obvious it's not going to be fixed. Rockstar just took the old versions. Now, these are like, you know, the 20-year-old version you can buy on the PC, and they put it back on the store, so you can buy that version again. It's not remastered, but it it's at least, it ha you know, at least you have shattering glass and particle effects. So, uh, yay? A small win? I mean, they're still yeah, selling so, for money. Yeah, yeah. The short answer is, yeah, it's it's easier today if you're starting from scratch, but it can actually be harder to make something that someone's already made than to just start over. Much harder, yeah. To recreate the effects of yesteryear using modern techniques is just a pain in the ass, and it just sucks because you know, oh, if I could just do this the modern way, it would be a thousand times easier. I've already got a tool that will do that, but it wouldn't look right. It either won't render right in this in this mutant old engine, or it just would look wrong in this world. Yeah, and once you start changing things, you have to kind of change everything, and then you're on the right. whole, like, which fans are you being true to territory. Right, like, um, oh, we could, we could have particle effects, but oh, wait, particle effects would use this kind of lighting. Well, we're not using that kind of lighting. We'd have to add that kind of lighting. And then we'd have to set up all those kinds of lights. And all of a sudden, you're creating more and more and more work for yourselves when all you wanted was to have shattering glass. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it creates this huge dependency chain of, if you were building the game from scratch right now, it would be no problem for everybody to just, like, do this one thing to every texture before you save it, you know, so that it can be used as, as a particle effect. But, you know... Uh, you can't do it now, or it would be horrible trying to do it now. So yeah, it should be easy, but past a certain threshold, it gets harder. So we have time for one more? I think we're running quite long today. Yeah, we are running long. I think, let's stop there. Those were all great questions, and we will tackle the rest of these next week. So thank you to everybody who sent us in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul.